Well, I want to welcome you back to our journey that we're going through uh, in regard to the book of Revelation. Last time we were together, uh, we went verse by verse through Revelation chapter 1, and today uh, we're going to go verse by verse through Revelation chapter 2, which is about four of the seven churches of Asia Minor that Jesus tells John to write to. And so before we open up chapter 2, let me refresh your memory out of chapter 1. I'll just read to you a couple verses. Revelation 1, verse 9. I, John, this is John, the beloved apostle of Jesus, your brother and companion in the suffering and in the kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so these are the seven churches that Jesus is going to speak to, he is going to utilize John to write this down, to send it to these different churches. And it's really interesting because people over the last 2,000 years, they've asked the question, uh, why these seven churches? I mean, there's so many churches at this point. We're nearing the end of the first century, and the church has blossomed from Jerusalem to all over the Roman Empire. So why these seven churches? Why not the church of Jerusalem, the mother church? Why not the church of Antioch, uh, where the believers were first called Christians? Why these seven churches? And uh, there's actually three answers to that. One, these are literal churches that John was writing to that he was the bishop of. You see, John was the bishop of Asia Minor. The Apostle Paul started up most of these churches, but after he was put to death by the Emperor Nero, John moved to Ephesus, and he became the bishop of Asia Minor. And so John was the leader of these literal churches. But not only are they literal churches, what we will see through church history is that these seven churches have a prophetic significance, a timeline for the history of the church. And then they're also extremely practical. Every church over the last 2,000 years can relate to these seven churches and the issues that we face. And not only is it practical for churches, it's very practical for believers. And so today, we will look at four of the seven churches uh, that are presented in chapter 2, and then chapter 3 is the last three churches. And what we'll see is that Jesus gives a performance evaluation uh, to each one of these churches that he is personally observing and he tells them what he sees. And it's interesting to think and ask the question, if Jesus was to give your church, my church, a performance evaluation, uh, what would he actually say? And so today we begin the journey in Revelation chapter 2 with the first of the seven churches. Revelation 2 verse 1, it reads... To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and he walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now what you'll notice is, to all seven churches, Jesus will say the exact same thing starting out. To the angel of the church in, whether it's Ephesus or whatever the case may be, I actually have a map of these seven churches in Asia Minor, and you can kind of see Ephesus was the port city. It was called the gate uh, to the east, and there was a road that went from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum, over to Thyatira, down to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea, and then back to Ephesus. It was a road of commerce, and this road of commerce was utilized in Asia Minor. And so what's interesting here, Jesus begins with the church in Ephesus, and he says, to the angel. Now, some people have taken that, that each church has its own angel, and uh, whether that is the case or not, I really don't know, but Jesus is not speaking of an angel, angel here. 
or to any of the other churches. The Greek word here is angelos, and angelos can mean messenger, human, or divine. So angelos is simply the Greek word for messenger. It can mean an angel, uh, but it can also be an earthly messenger. And in the case to the seven churches, Jesus is speaking to the earthly messenger of each of these churches, which would be the pastor. So you could literally read this as to the angel or to the pastor of the church in Ephesus, because here's what you've got to realize. When Jesus wants to speak to a local church, he will always go to the pastor first because Jesus doesn't bypass the spiritual authority that he himself has put into place. And so he's not speaking to an angel. He's speaking to the pastor of each of these churches. And that tells me and that informs me what the role, the primary role of the pastor is. The primary role of the pastor is to hear from Jesus and then to give a message from Jesus to the entire body. And so that's what we're going to see in all of these different churches. And then the word church is very important here as well. So we've got angelos, which is messenger, the pastor. And then we've got the word church. It's actually two different Greek words put together. The first one is ek, E-K. And ek means out. The other word is kaleo, which means called. So when you put ek, kaleo together, you get ekklesia. And ekklesia literally means the called out ones. Now what you got to realize, though, is that whenever the church first began, there wasn't Christian vocabulary. You know how we've got Christianese and other Christians, they understand the jargon that we use in our own circles. Well, Whenever Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail, Jesus is using a borrowed word. You see, the first ecclesia was actually in Athens. It was a called out assembly of 6,000 men in Athens. It was the first ecclesia, and these 6,000 men would meet up on a hill. And there would be a messenger who would speak to the governing body. And this ecclesia in Athens would determine legislation, would determine direction for uh, the city and the people. And it was literally a governing body. So when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, this is his governing body here on planet Earth. And I find that so incredible because Jesus also said, whatever you bind on Earth, it'll be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven because there is governing authority to the ecclesia, the called out ones. And so if you're a member of the church, you're a member of the governing body of the kingdom of God here on earth. And so Jesus speaks to the church in Ephesus. Now here's what you've got to know about Ephesus. Ephesus was the largest church during the first century. Ephesus was bigger than the church in Jerusalem. It was bigger than the church of Antioch. Ephesus was the big church. Ephesus had a rich history. It was founded by the Apostle Paul. It was then pastored by Timothy, led by John, and then later on Onesimus, who you'll read about in the book of Philemon. And so Ephesus has a rich history it's an incredible city. It's the gateway to the east. And so I want you to hear what Jesus says to this church. Revelation 2.1, we'll read it again, to the angel or to the pastor of the church in Ephesus write. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Jesus says, I know your deeds your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them to be false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. And so here, Jesus gives three commendations. He encourages this church. He says, you guys got sound doctrine. You've endured many trials and persecutions for my name. And then you also have good works. This is a good church. I mean, think about 
Jesus is telling this church, you've got sound doctrine, you've got good works, and you've got uh, perseverance. You've endured for my name. And so this is a really good church. Not only is it a big church, it's a really good church. But every church has its issues. Every church, including this one right here. There's a twist that comes in verse 4. Verse 4, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken. You could translate that you have left, not lost. You have left the love that you had at first. And what I find interesting here is that Jesus tells this church, you've got sound doctrine, you've got good biblical preaching and teaching, you've got good works. This is a church that's out making a difference in the world around them. They've endured persecution. They've not compromised. But Jesus says you've got everything except the most important thing. You've got everything but the main thing. You have left. Now, they didn't lose. They left the love they had at first. And what's interesting is 35 years before Jesus will say these words to this church in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul penned a letter to the church in Ephesus. We call it the book of Ephesians. And 35 years before this, Paul raved about the love in the church of Ephesus. And so over 35 years, their love had grown cold. And they had just been going through the motions. They knew what to do, and they were going through the motions. And for those of us who have been going to church a long time, it is easy to know what to do, to just go through the motions, but our hearts not to really be in it. And so what this church in Ephesus needs, it really needs revival. Now, when I say the word revival, here's what I know depending on your background. Revival could mean church for two weeks straight with a preacher who screams for three hours. Or revival can mean many different things to many different people. But what revival really is, is a reinvigorating force in life that makes something uh, that once you had a passion for, that you become passionate again for. You have to realize that revival is not for unbelievers because you cannot revive those who have never been made alive in the first place. So revival is not for the unchurched. Revival is for people like us, people who are part of the church of Ephesus. They need revival. And what's so beautiful in verse 5, Jesus gives this church and all of our churches the recipe for revival. Look at what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from among its places in the church. And so Jesus gives what I call the three R's to revival. Here's If you want revival in your life, you want revival in your church, Jesus tells us exactly how to do it. Remember, number one, remember what God has done. Remember the passion you had at first. Number two, repent. Now that word repent is uh, a not so popular word right now among many Christians. I think it's a bad word, but repentance is a beautiful thing. Repentance literally means to change the way you think, and when you change the way you think, it'll change the way you behave because right believing produces right living. Wrong believing produces wrong living. So Jesus says, remember, repent, and lastly, return. Revival is not about discovering something new. Revival is all about rediscovering uh, the passion that you once had for Jesus. You can have sound doctrine, you can have good works, and you can have perseverance, but you also have to have a passion, a heart desire for the Lord as well, uh, because this church, they got everything going for them. It's a good church, but they had left their first love, and so Jesus exhorts them and tells them how to come back uh, to that love they had at first. So that's the first church of the seven churches. We continue reading and we move on to the second church, 
which is the church of Smyrna. Very interesting church. Very different than the church in Ephesus. Smyrna was a very small city. And Revelation 2 verse 8, Jesus says to this church and to the angel, to the pastor, of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came back to life. So notice Jesus is using the same template to introduce himself to each of these churches. Verse 9, Jesus says, I know, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you're rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are actually a synagogue of Satan. Interesting, Jesus says, I know your affliction. We talked about this last time we were together in chapter 1. Affliction there is the Greek word thalipsis, which means suffocation, heavy pressure. It's where we get the word tribulation. And thalipsis was actually a practice of Roman soldiers in the form of torture to someone they were interrogating. They would lay down uh, the person they were interrogating, and they would put a boulder on their chest, and they would lower the boulder every so often as they were asking that person questions to the point that the pressure became so much you felt like you were suffocating. And so Jesus is saying to this church, I know the pressure you're under. I know the tribulation that you're going through. Now, what is their affliction? What is their thalipsis? Well, he tells us it's poverty. It's poverty. And there are two Greek words for poverty. The Greek word used here for poverty literally means abject poverty, like the lowest form of poverty there is in the world. These people were suffering so greatly. And then the question becomes, why were the Christians in the city of Smyrna suffering financially so greatly? Well, in many of these Roman cities during the first century, the economy was built upon what they referred to as trade guilds. Now, you may not know what a trade guild is, but you have an understanding of what a trade guild is because we have unions today. You have the auto union, you have the police union, uh, all these different types of unions. Well, in the first century, in the Roman Empire, if you were to have a skill set, let's say you were a carpenter or whatever the case may be, there would be a union uh, for that particular trade. It was called a trade guild. And each of the trade guilds, they had a patron god. So each trade guild had a god that was for that particular trade. Well, in order to be a part of the trade guild, you had to attend the annual meeting of the trade guild, which is where they would sacrifice meat to the god that was the patron god of the trade guild. They would get drunk, and then sexual orgies would take place. Well, if you're a Christian, this is very problematic because as a believer, if you choose to go to the trade guild meetings, well, then you're violating serving God and loving the Lord because now you're worshiping another God. But as a Christian, if you choose not to participate in the trade guilds, well, then you can't have a job. So as a Christian, you're in between a rock and a hard place. If you serve Jesus Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you cannot work in the city of Smyrna. But if you choose to work in the city of Smyrna, you cannot follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these Christians, they're in a tough spot. Look what Jesus says to them, though, in verse 10. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, you will not be hurt at all by the second death. And so I find it interesting, this small church 
that is going through great persecution and thalipsis, Jesus has no correction for. He simply acknowledges and says, I know what you're going through. And then he encourages them to stand strong. And then he talks about a crown. If they endure, they'll be given a crown. Here's something you may find interesting. Um, in the New Testament, there are five different crowns that believers like you and I can receive when we go to heaven. So our crowns in heaven, they'll be a lot like um, if you've ever seen someone in the military and they've got patches that represent their accomplishments, that's what your crown in heaven will basically be like. And the five different crowns are these. I'll read them to you. The crown of exaltation. Uh, this crown is given to those who win other people for Christ, the soul winners. The second crown is the crown of righteousness. Uh, this is for Christians who are eagerly expecting and awaiting for the return of Christ, which means you should be able to get this crown. All of us should be eagerly anticipating the return of Christ. Third is the crown of imperishability. Uh, this is for those who run their race in life with self-control and purity. The fourth one is the crown of glory. Uh, this is for those who lead in the church, but they lead with humility. And then the last one, the one we just read about, the crown of life. Those who endure persecution for Christ, and they endure it. I want you to notice, though, that Jesus is not oblivious to the pain of his people. He says, I know what you're going through. I, I personally, I know what you're going through. And Jesus says, stand firm. Stand firm. And maybe you're going through some stuff right now. I want you to know that God is not indifferent to what you're going through. He knows what you're going through. And if you're going through some stuff, I believe that God is doing something in you. Here's why I say this. Smyrna, the city, was built upon a certain product that they would ship all over uh, Asia Minor, even the rest of the Roman Empire. Smyrna's main product was myrrh. Now, remember when the wise men, they came and visited Jesus, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Smyrna, hence the name Smyrna, myrrh, Smyrna's industry, its economy, was built upon myrrh. Now, myrrh is a sweet-smelling fragrance. But the only way that myrrh releases its fragrance is it first has to be crushed. It has to be crushed for its fragrance to come out. A lot of times that's what it's like for us as believers. It's when we're going through the crushing. It's when we're experiencing thalipsis. That's what in us begins to come out of us. And it's a sweet smell that other people around us uh, can say, wow. There's something different about you and what is in you. And we've got the Lord Jesus Christ himself who was crushed for us so that the sweet fragrance of that myrrh would flow to the entirety of the world. So we've looked at two of the four churches here in the book of Revelation chapter 2. Now we're going to look at the third one. This is the church of Pergamum. Church of Pergamum, Revelation 2, verse 12. To the angel, to the pastor of the church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Now let me bring up the map one more time so that you can kind of see where we're at geographically. Ephesus is the port city. It's the largest city. It's got the largest church. This is where Jesus begins. And then we just looked at Smyrna, a much smaller city built upon myrrh. Now we go to Pergamum. Pergamum was also a very large city. It was the city where the governor of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, it is where the governor of Asia Minor uh, stayed. And so Pergamum was an interesting city. It was near the famous city of Troy. Uh, if you've ever, you know, the Trojan horse story, uh, Pergamum was the center of the imperial cult. It had a 40-foot statue of Zeus, and it was famous for its healing practices, its medicines. And so Revelation 2, verse 13, Jesus is going to speak uh, to this church. Now, something you should know about Pergamum 
is that it was world famous for its bathhouses and its theaters. Now, what happened at these bathhouses and these theaters uh, was sexual depravity. Uh, and Christians refused to attend the bathhouses or the theater uh, in Pergamum, and we'll see why. Revelation 2.13, Jesus says, I know where you live. Now remember, this is where the governor of Asia Minor lives. Uh, they've got a 40-foot statue of Zeus here. It's a very corrupt city. Jesus says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Now, Jesus repeats himself twice here, which I, I find to be interesting because he's driving home the point, I know where you live, and the city in which you live, Pergamum, this is where Satan lives. And so I think it's safe to assume this is where Satan himself was headquartered. Because you've got to realize Satan is not like God. Satan is not everywhere at all time. Satan is in one location at one time. And it seems as if Jesus is very clear here, Pergamum is the headquarters of Satan during this time. And can you imagine living in the city where Satan himself is headquartered? I mean, that's a wild thing to think about. Imagine just how rough that would have been. And so these Christians in Pergamum, they suffered, and they suffered big time. Antipas, who's mentioned here by Jesus, he paid the ultimate price. He was put to death. It's believed that Antipas was the pastor of the church of Pergamum. His name is interesting if you get into the etymology of Antipas, um, anti everything. That's what his name literally means, anti-everything, which that is what the Christians were known for during this time. The Christians were anti-theater. They were anti uh, the games of Rome. They were anti-bathhouses. The Christians didn't participate in any of these things, and um, Jesus commends them. Yet, I want you to notice something. Jesus has a word of correction for this church where Satan dwells. Verse 14, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate food sacrificed to idols, and they committed sexual immorality. Well, to understand what Jesus is saying here, you have to know who Balaam is, who Balak is, and this is a story in the Old Testament. It's actually in the book of Numbers. It's that book that nobody ever reads because it's kind of boring. But in the book of Numbers, chapters 22 through 25, uh, it's the story of Balaam and Balak. Now, you've got to understand that Balaam was a contemporary of Moses. They lived at the same time. Balaam was world famous. Balaam was considered a prophet. Now, he wasn't a prophet like Moses. Balaam was a prophet of Baal, hence the name Balaam. He was a prophet of the god Baal. He was literally a witch. He was a world famous witch because Balaam would put curses on nations, on tribes, on families, on individuals. And so there's a king, the king of Moab. His name is Balak. Balak sees the Israelites coming in his direction, and he's terrified. These are the Israelites that just took down the mighty Egyptian empire. Balak doesn't know what to do. And so Balak gets an idea. I'm going to hire this witch called Balaam to come and curse the Israelites. And so Balak sends an offer to the witch, and uh, Balaam says, no, no, I'm not going to take your money. But then Balak says, I will give you a house full of silver, a house full of gold. And Balaam says, count me in, here I come. And so Balaam comes to cast a spell on the Israelites. And it's interesting what Balaam says after he tried seven times. So this witch, who's world famous for casting spells, 
Seven times he tries to curse the Israelites. Numbers 23, verse 7, it says, Then Balaam spoke his message. Balak brought me from Aram, the king of Moab, from the eastern mountains. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. And look at verse 8. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? You know what that tells me? The most powerful witch on this planet today has no power over God's people. That is why at Halloween time, you don't have to be afraid of all the witches that are gathering together, trying to place curses on people. If you are in the body of Christ, you have been redeemed from the cursed, and the great I am resides on the inside of you. You know, sometimes, about once a month, I get letters from the satanic temple, and they send me these letters uh, pronouncing curses on me and curses upon my family and the church and all these different things. And some Christians, they'll freak out. They'll be like, oh my gosh, you've got to break those curses. I don't have to break those curses. Those curses, they bounce right off of me because I am covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, whom God has not cursed, no witch can curse, whom God has blessed, no witch can curse. Now, here's the problem though. Balaam realizes I cannot curse God's people. But Balaam comes up with an idea. I may not be able to curse God's people, but God's people, through their own decisions, can bring about cursing upon themselves. And look at what Balaam tells Balak to do in Numbers 25. He tells Balak, you can entice God's people into a trap. In Numbers 25, verse 1, it says, While Israel was staying in Shittim. Now, you got to have a strong emphasis on the I there. It's Shittim. Shittim. The men began to indulge. This is the Hebrew soldiers. They begin to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women. So what Balak literally does he sends a bunch of Moabite women, completely naked, no clothes on them at all, to a group of Hebrew soldiers that haven't seen their wives in a long time. And they fell for the trap. These Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices of their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And the Lord's anger burned against them. So when Jesus says to the church of Pergamum, some of you are holding to Balaam's doctrine. What is he saying? There are some of you in this church that although Satan cannot curse you, even though you live in his city, because you are compromising, you are bringing about a curse upon yourself. You see, the wages of sin, it's death. As surely as sin goes, death does follow. And so Jesus is challenging this church to repent. Now look at verse 15. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, I didn't read this verse earlier to you, but Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 is... Jesus speaking to the church in Ephesus, and he says, you've got this going for you. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Well, here Jesus brings up the Nicolaitans again, and he says, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So the question then becomes, all right, who are the Nicolaitans? Why does Jesus hate their deeds, hate their doctrines, and what does that say to us today? Well, the Nicolaitans were a group of early Christians, they claim to be Christians, that fall under a category that we now label as Gnostic Christians. Gnostic Christians, they tried to blend Greek philosophy with Christian theology, and this is what they believed. 
they believed that you were a good spirit stuck inside an evil body, that your spirit is inherently good and your body is inherently evil. And because you have a good spirit stuck inside an evil body, salvation is literally escaping the evil material world and entering into the pure, the good, and the spiritual world. There's actually a painting that kind of describes this of the process of salvation, of somebody trying to escape the material world to enter into the spiritual world because the spiritual world is good, the material world is evil. That is Greek philosophy. That is not Christian theology. The Bible does not teach that the material world is evil. The Bible teaches that the material world is fallen. You see, when God created everything, he pronounced over everything, and it is good. The material world was created good. But because of sin, the material world is in a fallen state. And salvation is not escaping this material world. Salvation for us believers is not tasting the second death and having resurrected bodies. Our resurrected bodies are going to be physical bodies. Here was the problem with the Nicolaitans. They believed that since your body was inherently evil and since your spirit was inherently good, there was two camps. There was the strict aesthetics who said, starve your flesh. No sexual enjoyment, no good food, no pleasures in life. Starve your evil body. And then there was another camp. These were the libertines. They said, well, since your body is already inherently evil, evil plus evil is evil, and since your spirit is inherently good and that can't change, you might as well enjoy life while you're here and do anything and everything you want to do in your body because it doesn't matter. Your body is already evil. And Jesus says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans because they have brought about mixture. They brought mixture into what it means to be a Christian because the Bible is very clear. What you do in your physical body, it matters. So Jesus corrects this church, but I got to show you something so amazing in verse 17. Verse 17, Jesus says, whoever has ears... Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now, to us, receiving a white stone in heaven, that doesn't mean anything at all. But to these Christians in Pergamum, oh my goodness, it was a real blessing and reward. Because like today, if you're to go to a sporting event or a concert, you have a ticket. You get a ticket on your phone, and they scan the ticket so you can have entrance into the event. Well, they had tickets during the time of the first century in Rome. But the tickets were not printed tickets or electronic tickets. Tickets were a white stone. A white stone would get you entrance into the theater, would get you entrance into uh, the sporting events. And VIP tickets, all access tickets, would be a white stone with your name written on it. Get the imagery here. Jesus says in this life, you may not get a ticket to the theater. You may not get a ticket uh, to some of the stadiums where they're doing terrible things. But Jesus says, if you'll endure, when you enter into glory, I'm going to give you not just a ticket in the heaven, I'm going to give you a ticket with a new name written on it. You're getting a VIP all-access ticket for eternity into heaven with me. And you've got to imagine how encouraging that must have been for the church of Pergamum. Now, we've looked at three. Now we're to our fourth and final church of Revelation chapter 2. It's the church of Thyatira. And let's read it here. To the angel... Of the church in Thyatira, right. Now, pull up the map real quickly so we can see just where this particular city is. So Thyatira was to the east of Pergamum, 
Now, you have to remember Pergamum was the capital city uh, of Asia Minor. And so Thyatira actually becomes a military outpost as a first line of defense to protect Pergamum from invaders from the east. Pergamum was uh, uh, the big city, the capital city. Thyatira, however, was a small military outpost uh, that was meant to defend Pergamum. So in the city of Thyatira, you've got all these soldiers. You've got all these needs. They need food. They need clothing. They need shelter. And so here comes the trade guilds, the trade guilds to Thyatira. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we continue reading Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, remember, we read about this in chapter 1. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than what you did at first. Nevertheless, I've got this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Uh Uh-oh. In every Christian church, people who get mad at other people, especially when it comes to getting mad at a woman in the church, they'll say, you're a Jezebel. And so we're going to find out what that actually means. Uh, You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet by her teachings. Notice what she does. She misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. So This Jezebel here, this prophet in the church of Thyatira, she is leading God's people into the trade guilds because it was at the trade guilds that sexual immorality and sacrificing the idols took place. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say this to the rest of you in Thyatira. To you who do not hold to her teaching. And have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you. Except to hold on to what you have until I come. And I get a sense here that Jesus is not very happy uh, with this particular woman called Jezebel. Or the people who are following uh, Jezebel here. Something you may find interesting is that Jezebel here is not a name, uh, but it's a title. And um, two of our earliest manuscripts that we have, when you translate this, Jesus says, and that woman of yours, Jezebel. And some, some scholars, have landed on the conclusion Who is Jesus speaking here to? Well, he's speaking to the pastor of the church of Thyatira. And some of the earliest translations say, that woman yours, Jezebel. That that woman who is yours, Jezebel. And it very well could be that Jesus is referring to the pastor's wife here. And he calls the pastor's wife Jezebel. It's a title. It's an Old Testament figure. It's a title. And the reason he does this is because... She is leading God's people into the trade guilds, and she's probably rationalizing it. Well, you have to have an ability to make a living. You have to be able to feed your family. So go be a part of the trade guilds. Go into the sexual immorality, into the sacrificing uh, to the gods, and everything will be just fine. And because of her platform as possibly being the pastor's wife, you can imagine the influence that she would have had upon members in the body. And so Jesus says, I've given her time to repent, but she refuses, which is encouraging for all of us that whenever we mess up, that God gives us time to repent. He gives us space to repent. But if we choose not to, 
His judgment is coming. It may not be swift. It may not be fast. But it is coming. And so he tells that woman Jezebel to repent, but she refuses. Now you have to realize Jezebel was an Old Testament queen. She was the uh, wife of a wicked king named Ahab. And Jezebel was a Phoenician uh, princess, and she was married to Ahab. And what Jezebel did was she brought in the prophets of Baal to the nation of Israel. And she literally put the prophets of Baal on the state payroll. She got rid of all the other prophets of God. And she tried to kill uh, the prophet Elijah. And so she introduces Baal worship to the people of Israel. And she has a terrible demise. She gets eaten by dogs, which Elijah prophesied would take place. What's interesting, though, the dogs didn't eat her skull, her hands, or her feet. They ate everything else, not her skull, her hands, or her feet. And the question then becomes, why did the dogs not eat the skull, the hands, or the feet of Jezebel? I want to show you why, and this is where we'll end today. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes. Now, where are the eyes in the skull? A lying tongue. Where is a lying tongue in the skull? Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil a false witness who pours out lies, which comes from the mouth and the skull, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. I find it so interesting. The dogs did not eat the skull, the hands, or the feet of Jezebel because everything the Lord hates was contained, those seven things, within her skull, her hands, and her feet. Even the dogs knew how wicked that woman was. And so Jesus labels this woman in the New Testament. She is a Jezebel. Jezebel is a manipulator that always leads God's people into compromise. Now, Revelation 2, verse 26, the final three verses here. Jesus says, To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like poverty. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so today I hope you were blessed by reading through the entire chapter of Revelation 2, looking at four of the seven churches of Asia Minor and the words that Christ has for those churches Next time we're together, we will look at the final three churches, uh, which comprise the entirety of Revelation chapter 3, and we will continue on this journey through what is arguably uh, one of the most fascinating books in all the Bible, the book of Revelation. I hope today you were blessed, and I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.